You know, it is the book of Ecclesiastes that uh, reminds us that to everything, there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. Now, I can't help but think that even though we acknowledge that sort of thing with our, with our minds, I think few of us are ever really prepared for the hurricane of emotions that are let loose in our lives through the experience of grief and loss. There are few experiences in life that are more devastating and more disorienting than grief and loss. You know, too, in grief and loss, often uh, when we're thinking about it, and this is where we're primarily going to be today, that, uh, but grief and loss comes in lo- from all kinds of different experiences, as you know in your own life. Um, it can be the loss of, uh, of a friend or a family member, a, a loved one. It can be the loss of a job. It can be the loss of a pet. It can be loss of a, of a relationship. It, it, there, there, there are all kinds of things in our lives that uh, uh, suddenly come into our life and it sneaks up on us the power of grief and what it does to us in, in those moments. You know, those of you who are already have or are currently are walking in the dark country of grief, you understand why I've included this subject in a series called Overloaded. Because grief is overwhelming. And sadly, all of us will be touched by this bitter experience. You know, even Jesus, the very Son of God, you know, you'd think if anybody was going to kind of get some kind of immunity from some of the the worst aspects of life, it would be him. Even Jesus was not immune from grief. In Matthew 14, when Jesus heard of the execution of, of John the Baptist, his cousin, Matthew tells us that uh, he then went, he withdrew to a solitary place, obviously wanting to just kind of step out of the limelight for a little bit and just be allowed to grieve. Well, that's that famous incident in John 11 at the tomb of Lazarus. And as Jesus approaches uh, Lazarus' tomb, What was his reaction? He wept. He wept. You know, we look at those incidents and realize they serve to underscore what Isaiah predicted of the Messiah, that he would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And that was Jesus. That was Jesus. And it's it's interesting that... uh, this, again, this is something that none of us ever escape. Sometimes when we're younger and you hear, you hear something like this, you think, oh, well, that's for older people. When it, it's, you know, uh, grief touched my own life at a very young age. Well, relatively young age. I was 20 when, when my mom died. You know, so I, I've, I've had to walk in this place from a, a relatively young age, at least compared to where I'm at now. And some of you will have to do that as well. So this morning, I want us to reflect a bit on grief. And as we do so, to remind ourselves of how powerful it is, while at the same time, seeking ways that allow us to grieve, but not as those who have no hope. So let's get into this. And as we do so, first of all, we are reminded that grief is a powerful and unique emotion. As a matter of fact, it's hard to say that any one, any two people experience grief in exactly the same way. Grief is, often gets expressed in unique ways in everybody's life, but there are some broad categories and broad experiences that we, we can talk about. It's interesting, someone has characterized grief as like a vine that grows up around your life and slowly begins to strangle your life. I came across uh, several descriptions of what grief is like. One person put it this way. 
Grief is like this person who you don't want in your life, but you can't get rid of. Grief is like the vilest flu you can imagine. It's constant chest pain. It's constant fear and so much of the unknown. Being a grieving person is draining because some days you think you've made it through and then the next you're back at square one. It never leaves you. And if you, st- if you can stand in front of your peers and say you're fixed now, you are lying. You are never fixed. Grief is like holding your breath for too long. Everything stops being easy. It's like going to work extremely ill. Nothing is enjoyable, not even sitting still in silence. When something is remotely positive, you're reminded that your loved one is not here to experience this with you. Perhaps many of you have read C.S. Lewis's description of his own grief. He, uh, he wrote a book entitled A Grief Observed, which uh, I, I recommend that anybody who is uh, experiencing grief uh, read it, if for no other reason dis- than just the rawness and the honesty of it. C.S. Lewis wrote about his grief this way. No one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. I'm not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. The same fluttering of the stomach, the same restlessness, the yawning. I keep on swallowing. At other times, it feels like being mildly drunk or concussed. There's a sort of invisible blanket between the world and me. I find it hard to take in what anyone says, or perhaps hard to want to take it in. It is so uninteresting. Yet I want others to be around me. I dread the moments when the house is empty. If only they would talk to one another and not me. Again, just some of the reactions and the results of grief. And they are a reminder that the experience of grief must be approached patiently and oh so lovingly. Well, as we go further, because of the emotions, because the emotions of grief are so powerful, it reminds us that we must find a way to adequately express those emotions. You know, I think this is especially true in, in Christian circles. I, I don't know that it's so much true uh, in this particular congregation, but, you know, I, I, I've seen this over the years where there, uh, there has been sometimes this subtle inference in Christian circles that if you're grieving a little bit too much, well, we're just a little curious about just how strong your faith really is. We've got to wonder, you know, well... We, didn't you really believe all that Jesus stuff? I mean, if, if you really did, why are you grieving like this? That's a subtle message that needs to be counteracted as strongly as possible. I've contributed to this. I remember as a young minister uh, quoting this poem that I found for a funeral. It said, Grieve not for me, nor let one tear fall. What you dream of, I now see, and friend, it's worth it all. Now, the sentiment behind that is right and good and true, but it's lousy advice for somebody in the midst of their loss. Grieve not for me, nor let one tear fall. That's about all that will do is ensure that somebody is going to go to a toxic level with their grief. Now, again, in regards to the Christian faith, the message of hope is always, always there. But grieving needs to have the opportunity to be expressed. Nothing could be further from the truth that Christian hope removes the need for grieving. Again, the example of Jesus, as we saw earlier, uh, shows that what a lie that kind of thing is. 
If Jesus felt a need to, to even publicly express grief, how much so, more so you and me? In preparing for this, I was moved by the insight of an author named Jerry Sitzer. Jerry Sitzer is a Christian. He's a Bible college lecturer. And he's a, the author of a book on grief. And he became an author in a book on grief because he knew about his subject all too well. His grief came up and slapped him in an instant. In what, it, there was a day when he and his family were out traveling and his wife and daughter and mother were killed when they were struck by a drunk driver. Three generations gone in a moment. And it's interesting, as he reflects on all this and tries to put it together and tries to offer something to, to people like himself who are going through grief, he notes that much of our modern language about grief communicates, just get over it, okay? I mean, look, you've had a little bit of time here, and that's good, but this is awkward. I think it's time you just move on. And suddenly that message comes through, you know, just get over it. But Sitzer goes on to write, you don't get over it. You grow into it. You begin to wear it. And it becomes part of the landscape of your life. It's not over. It's in you. He goes on to write in his book, I did not get over the loss of my loved ones. Rather, I absorbed the loss into my life like soil received decaying matter until it became a part of who I am. Sorrow took up permanent residence in my soul and enlarged it enlarged it. I was intrigued by that observation because not only did it remind us that we just don't get over grief. It just doesn't just one day, okay, that's enough. Let's get on with life. We don't get over it. We learn to live with it, to absorb it into the reality of our lives. But also, how he noted that grief experienced and expressed in healthy ways can actually enlarge our souls. Now, I think sometimes a thought like that, almost on the surface anyway, sounds absurd. But reality is it reflects deep wisdom. A deep wisdom that was caught many centuries ago by Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 2 and 4. Just some fascinating words and, uh, as we look at this text. Listen to these words. It's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men. And the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad, sad countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Does that sound a little, a little strange? Yet there's deep wisdom in those words. As bitter and disorienting as grief might be, the experience of it does something in us that actually causes us to become better people. Those who have known grief find that often their priorities have been reshaped. Those knowing grief find their capacity for patience and compassion is enlarged. Their hearts are softer because they've walked in the dark place of deep sadness. I think that's what Solomon was getting at. 
that there is something in the process of grief, as, as bitter as it is to taste, as, as, as unwanted as it is in our life, as we go through it, the Lord is even able to use this awful experience to deepen us, change us, and make us a person that somehow responds to life at a level that we didn't previously. It's kind of a reminder of an old truth that we learned along the way, and that's this. The fruit of the Spirit grows best in bad soil. Things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. The fruit of the Spirit grows best in bad soil. And beloved, I believe that grief and loss are often the kinds of soil in our lives that allows some of those fruits of the Spirit to take deeper root in us. We learn more about love. We learn more about kindness. We learn more about patience through, the, through a process like grief. And here's the point. Grief is not useless in your life. None of us wants it. None of us seeks it. But in the economy of God, it's never useless. It can potentially enlarge us, especially if we find ways to express it in healthy and consistent ways. And that's where I want to point you before I conclude. Here are, I hope, some healthy responses to grief. There are a lot, there are a lot of places you can look. There are a lot of good resources that you can go online and find uh, uh, to help you as you, as you experience grief. But I'd like to uh, just suggest some healthy responses just as part of our morning together. And the first healthy response just underscores what we've been saying, but with, in grief, do not try to rush it. Don't try to rush it. Don't think that there's some kind of track. You can say, if I can get on this track, it, we're go this is going to be the fast lane and I'll get through it. It doesn't really work like that. Grief won't be rushed. For some, it will take months and even years to even get to a point where they're able to live with the reality of grief in their life. And so as a result, understand that perhaps you need to be patient with yourself. And as you're patient not only with yourself, too, you need to resist the well-meaning but misguided attempts by others to help you hurry along with your grief. There will be those who will be uncomfortable with your grief. There will be those who just, mm, you'll just have to live with that. But don't let them pressure you into something that will ultimately work against a healthy experience of grief in your life. Shed your tears. Talk about your loss. Speak of the one who has died. Be patient with yourself. This is not something that diminishes quickly. And Lamott wrote, you will lose someone you cannot live without and your heart will be badly broken. And the bad news is that you never completely get over the loss of your beloved. But this is also good news. They live forever in your broken heart that never heals. They live forever in your broken heart that doesn't seal back up. And you come through. It's like having a broken leg that never heals perfectly, that still hurts when the weather gets cold, but you learn to dance with a limp. That's the first thing. Don't rush it. Second thing, a second healthy response is learn to pray your grief. Learn to pray your grief. It's interesting how that during the process of grieving that people 
often discover afresh the power of the Psalms, the prayer book of, of the church, really. And I think they discover the freshness of the Psalms because a good portion of the Psalms are lament and outward grieving that, that uh, 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 lifts to God uh, expressions of our, of our pain and frustration. And as you go through the Psalms, you can see some pretty raw things being said to God. You can see some, some emotions just being poured out and expressing, praying, if you will, grief. I think there's a good example of this in Psalm 77, the opening verses. I cried to God. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. If you've known anybody in grief, you've known that they've had times like that. That's not unfaith or a lack of faith. That's a lament, praying grief into the presence of God. If anything, that's a true expression of faith. That God, this situation and this circumstance and what I'm feeling is just overwhelming. This, is, this stuff is tearing me apart. Where are you? Yet I pray, seeking you. Praying your grief not only allows all the powerful emotions to be expressed, but at the same time connects you in the process with the hope of the Lord. That leads to a third healthy response. And that is that through the whole process of grief, regularly immerse yourself in God's promises. Regularly. Immerse yourself in God's promises. Now, I appreciate that in the beginning, a lot of that will feel artificial. A lot of it will just feel like I'm just going through the motions. A lot of it will feel like this is just going right off of me. But as you continue to immerse yourself in the truths of who God is, what he has done for you, and allow that just to continue to wash over you, it begins to have a good effect on you. Immerse yourself in God's promises. Allow the intensity of grief to slowly be tempered by the truth of God. Again, truths like the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. That's an important one for one who is grieving. There's something about a broken heart that just seems to attract God rather than repel Him. Allow your, your heart to hear Jesus speaking again. The same words that He spoke at, a, at Lazarus' tomb. I am the resurrection, and the life. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Death may separate, but it isn't the final word. Or again, perhaps most of all, immerse yourself in God's greatest promise. As that, for instance, that which is probably best expressed in Revelation Chapter 21, verses 3 to 5. Again, familiar, ver familiar verses, but what words for the grieving? And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And this is his great promise to all who mourn. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. In the midst of the despair of grief, when it feels like the world is collapsing, when it feels like this world has nothing to offer, 
We need to hear things like this. We need to immerse ourselves and remind ourselves that as, as bleak as it seems right now, as, as painful as it is to walk in this place, death is not the last word for our world. New creation is the last word. And that day will come when there will be nothing in our experience to cause any tears, any mourning, any pain. Because the old order has passed away. It is truth such as these that allow us to grieve, but not as those who have no hope. Here's the final thing. To be healthy with this, share your grief. Share your grief. I know and I appreciate that uh, the first inclination is to just shut yourself off from the world. I get that. And there may be a time and a, and a brief period when you need to do that. Even Jesus was seeking to do that. Although if you read the rest of that incident where Jesus tried to withdraw to a, a quiet place, the crowds just pressed in on him. He didn't even get a moment. But you need to find ways to share your grief. You need to find someone, a trusted one, that will be willing to sit with you and journey with you at your pace. Somebody who'll be willing to just be quiet. Somebody who'll be willing to put up with the various emotions that will come as a result of your grief. Someone who'll let you, to be, let you be angry at one moment, let you be sad at another, let you be happy when, it, when that time comes. Somebody that will just be with you and journey with you you may need to withdraw from the crowd for a time, but don't allow yourself to be shut off. Because if you do, I believe that it has, a, it has the effect of short-circuiting your grief. And as it gets short-circuited, it becomes more toxic, more lethal in your life. On the flip side, those of us who are part of a fellowship like this, a family like this, we need to be very cognizant of those grieving among us. We need to be ones who are more than Job's comforters, just kind of spouting uh, uh, scriptural platitudes that are, that are of no help whatsoever. We need to be ones who genuinely bear one another's burdens. Uh, I've, I've put together, well, I, I didn't put it together. I found something that I've made available. Um, uh, this, this comes from an organization called the Australian Center for Grief and Bereavement. And it is how to help someone who is grieving. Uh, we've got some sheets on the back table back there. Um, look, I'd suggest if, you, if you're trying to walk with someone or, you know, in their grief, this is, there's just some good practical advice I encourage you to pick that up. We're not going to take time to do that today. But it's worthwhile looking at these sort of things. Again, so that together, together, we can bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. Beloved, I wish I could shield you from the experience of grief, but that's impossible. And... If what Solomon said is true, it would be foolish. There are things to be discovered and known in grief. I pray that uh, as we all experience grief, which we inevitably will, that we'll be able to do it in a way that uh, allows the Lord to be a part of it and demonstrates to our world that it is possible to grieve well and in a healthy way. Let's pray. Lord, you know the grief that uh, is present in this room, Lord, and I, I bless each one. Whatever their experience of grief is at this moment, I, I thank you, Lord, that you have said to us that uh, you come to us by your Spirit as the Comforter. And I pray that that, will, that experience will be renewed to each grieving one right now.
that, Lord, who you are, what you have said, that your truth and your presence will, will come and envelop again and renew and strengthen. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to live our hope. Help us to walk even in these most awful of human experiences with your light and presence alive in us. Lord, we pray that even our grief might honor you and give testimony to your great victory over everything. So we bless you, Lord. We bless you and thank you for your comfort. In Jesus' name, amen.